How we explain terrorism has important implications. Our ability to explain what causes terrorism informs how we respond to it. To better understand what lies behind terrorist motivations, we need to consider whether they are acting rationally, the mechanisms leading to their radicalization, and the influences of socioeconomic and psychological factors. These different explanations for terrorism point toward different solutions and responses. Consider one of the major questions about terrorism. Are terrorists rational? Can we explain terrorism by saying that terrorists are rational or reasoning actors? From their own perspective, do they make decisions by weighing the benefits against the costs? If terrorists are rational, then we can predict things like how and where they will commit attacks, which is necessary to prevent future attacks. If terrorists are rational, they should also be more likely to choose terrorism under certain conditions, such as when a terrorist group is small and has few other resources than violence, when the importance of change is perceived as critical and immediate, when targets are considered to be vulnerable, and when they have the necessary material, financial, and technical support. In addition to the conditions conducive to terrorism, the rational perspective of terrorism helps us to think about the costs and benefits of choosing terrorism through the terrorist size. Some benefits of committing acts of terrorist violence might include getting media attention to their grievances, creating social and political instability, and forcing the government to respond. Terrorists often want to see officials respond and legitimize their movements as threats. Of course, there are always potential costs to terrorist violence, including getting the government to respond. Yes, this could be a benefit or a cost, depending on their specific goals. Government retaliation could result in them being arrested or being killed. It could also lead to a loss of support from potential sympathizers who may view their terrorist actions as unnecessary, counterproductive, or perhaps just a bridge too far. One argument supporting the idea that terrorists are rational actors is collective rationality, which maintains that terrorists have a number of options to bring about political change, and terrorism is chosen when all other legitimate political and social alternatives are deemed to be more costly than beneficial. They learn from their successes and failures and those of other terrorists and choose the tactics that make the most sense, that have the best chances of succeeding. An alternative view to this is that while terrorists might make rational decisions, they do not make them entirely willingly and instead engage in terrorism because they have come to believe they have no other alternative tactics to choose from to achieve their goals. That said, what if terrorists are not rational? Well, if terrorists are not rational, then predicting when and where the next attack might come from becomes more challenging, if not impossible. From this perspective, psychological forces influence their decisions. One psychological perspective is that terrorists are psychologically fragmented, that they have an internal enemy within them, a sort of psychological split that they need to reconcile. This leads to scapegoating others who represent this quote-unquote bad part of themselves. Attacking these blamed others is representative of fighting the internal enemy, the part of themselves that they hate. Those who argue terrorists are psychologically disturbed point to patterns of personal loss, abuse, trauma, or failure prior to engaging in terrorism. While there is some merit to this perspective, the predominance of research conducted on the psychology of terrorism has not identified a single psychological profile or any kind of terrorist personality, nor is mental illness prominent among terrorists, at least not any more than the general population. And while abuse and trauma are prominent in their backgrounds, they do not by themselves explain decisions to engage in terrorism. So terrorists aren't entirely irrational, and other forces are at play. But even if terrorists do exhibit at least some degree of rationality in their decision making, this only helps explain how terrorists make decisions after they've already become terrorists. It does not explain how they became terrorists in the first place. How do terrorists end up on the road toward terrorism? This leads us to radicalization. Radicalization is the term used to explain the process of gradually accepting more and more extreme and radical social, political, and religious views. One useful overview, provided by Macaulay and Moskalenko, outlines the various mechanisms of radicalization at the individual, group, and societal levels, and we'll review each of these in turn. Beginning with individual radicalization, the first mechanism is personal victimization. This is the sense that the individual has been victimized personally not in a way that is tied directly to any ideology, but any kind of harm or perceived harm that can trigger a sense of victimization. If this harm is attributed to an external force or group, it may trigger a desire for revenge. 
Personal victimization, or even perceptions of personal victimization, is often the starting point for becoming radicalized. It is certainly far from a sure thing, though. Many people are victimized or feel victimized, yet don't fall onto the path of radicalization. So something else also needs to happen. This is where political grievance comes into play. This is where individuals are moved to action based on external events not directly tied to them personally, but to a broader social, political, or religious cause. It's not enough to just feel like a victim, but the individual needs to tie that victimization to a broader ideology in some way. For this reason, individuals becoming radicalized entirely on their own with no external influences is rare. There needs to be sympathy toward a broader ideological cause to draw them in. This is why individuals who seemingly carry out acts of terrorism on their own are usually tied in some way to a broader ideological movement, even if only as just a sympathizer. This does not necessarily imply direct personal contact or association with other extremists. The connection could be through consuming extremist propaganda, such as through physical literature or materials circulating online. Individuals who feel they've suffered personal victimization and political grievance may not be spurred to terrorist action on their own, but rather to seek out like-minded individuals who share the same beliefs. This may lead them to ultimately join a radical or extremist group. This is not usually an immediate decision, but rather a slow, gradual process of getting to know other people in the group and increasingly accepting their ideology, attitude, and norms of behavior. Personal bonds are formed and connections with a broader network of extremists are developed. Research on social networks has consistently pointed to the enhanced strength of having multiple types of ties between individuals, including common friendship, romantic, familial, business, ethnic, and religious ties. This is one of the commonly accepted explanations for how women and children become terrorists. They are drawn in through their close connections with men, fathers, brothers, male friends, and of course, lovers. But it's also important to note, women become radicalized through the same processes as men. And women becoming involved in terrorism is not a new or rare phenomenon. This differs by extremist ideology. Traditionally, women have been more involved with far-left and Islamic jihadist terrorism, but not exclusively. Women are also involved in far-right movements, especially in terms of non-violent financial crime. Women are more likely to have operational and support roles than their male counterparts. But women can also provide a tactical advantage for violent attacks as well, as they are less likely to be viewed with suspicion as possible suspects. And then children are another matter. Children are increasingly involved in terrorism as well. There is much less we know about this phenomenon specifically, but we can look toward how children adopt their views more broadly for some answers. How they are socialized at a young age, the influences of their family and peers, how they are indoctrinated into accepting extremist beliefs. And in the most severe cases, some very young children have been used as weapons in violent suicide attacks. It's not that these kids actively know what they're doing. They're simply trusting their adult caregivers, who clearly don't have their best interests in mind. These are troubling developments that we are aiming to better understand going forward. Next, let's turn to group radicalization. Once within a group environment, the influences of group cohesion take hold, and any extreme beliefs an individual held before entering the group are amplified, solidified, and internalized. This is referred to as the extremity shift in like-minded groups. Individuals are more likely to adopt the views of the group as they spend more time under its influence. Another factor that comes into play is extreme cohesion when under threat or isolated from others. This often develops under strenuous conditions, when people are stuck in a foxhole together and bond over their common struggle and a lack of interaction with others outside of the group dynamic. This increases the value the group has to individuals within it, increasing the pressure to conform to group norms and beliefs in order to be accepted. This can include increasing acceptance of violence to further the group's beliefs or protect the group from the influences of perceived enemies. Then there is within group competition. This is where personal and ideological interests clash, and infighting threatens to tear the group apart. Competition for status within a group could result in internal pressure quelling the dissension with one side maintaining or taking over a dominant position, or the group could end up splintering into different subgroups made up of different factions, with each further solidified in their own beliefs. It could also ultimately lead to the group completely disbanding, too. This points to another mechanism of group radicalization, competition for the same base of support, where extreme actions can be taken in an attempt to bring the group greater status and prestige among sympathizers to their cause. This occurs when the group is competing with other groups for the same supporters and want to draw those sympathizers to support them as opposed to the rival groups. 
Think, for example, of Al-Qaeda and ISIL competing for the support of sympathizers by claiming responsibility for increasingly brutal acts of terrorist violence. Each group wants to show they are the true leaders in the global jihadist extremist movement. This competition among and within terrorist groups is related to competition with state power. Uses of force by the state that are seen as excessive frequently serve to trigger feelings of political grievance. Waco, Ruby Ridge, the Persian Gulf War, unjustified police shootings are just a few notable examples. Many people feel a sense of political grievance as a result of these and similar actions, and most don't turn toward extremism as a result. The vast majority of those who do respond do so in a generally accepted and peaceful way. That said, extremists do utilize these incidents to solicit support from sympathizers. Extremist groups also try to goad the government into responding in ways that can be deemed excessive so that this use of force can be used to gain sympathy with potential supporters and possibly trigger these feelings of political grievance in them. Similar tactics have also been used in recent years with far-right and far-left groups trying to provoke each other into attacking them first so they can use it to rally support from those who are sympathetic to their cause but have not yet been mobilized to action. It could also be used as a justification for retaliatory violence. This is closely tied to mass radicalization and is referred to by Macaulay and Maskalenko as jujitsu politics. Mass radicalization is when there are major forces that lead to more widespread beliefs on a larger scale, not just restricted to a tightly knit extremist group. Essentially, mass radicalization extends the ideas behind the influences of group dynamics to the societal level, where conflict can be redirected as stemming from a broader outgroup, or group that can be commonly considered as the other group. It's a group that can be pointed to as the enemy, the source of the problems they face, where their grievances are directed. This can occur in the context of pressure to conform to general attitudes of religious, political, or ethnic identity, but also when invoking strong feelings of patriotism or nationalism. Taken to the most extreme, it can extend to outright hate directed toward the other group, projecting to all members of that group a commonly shared bad essence, where all members of the other group are considered the same and pose the same threats. Members of the other group are typically dehumanized, no longer thought of as human beings but as objects or animals, less than human. This makes it easier to justify their hatred and to perpetuate acts of violence against any individual thought to be part of that other group. It also renders alternative options for dealing with the other group pointless. If the other group is considered inherently bad, inferior, or evil, what is the point of reasoning with them, negotiating with them? What difference will providing them with education or resources make? The only solution from this perspective is to marginalize, segregate, or completely eliminate the other group. This is where this demonizing hatred of the other ultimately leads if left unchecked. We'll conclude by looking at another major question in assessing explanations for terrorism. Do socioeconomic factors like lack of education, poverty, and social inequality lead to terrorism? Unfortunately, the research on this question is limited. It's mostly anecdotal where people pick and choose certain examples to support their argument. We don't have enough evidence to establish or discredit a link between education and terrorism, for example. We do know that those who grow up being indoctrinated into extremist beliefs from a very young age Age are going to be more likely to embrace them when they are adults, but there is a lot more going on in this kind of environment than a highly skewed education. We also know that certain types of terrorists, like far-left terrorists and eco-terrorists, are generally more highly educated. And many who embrace other extremist ideologies are highly educated as well. So we certainly can't say that low education leads to terrorism. There just hasn't been a clear causal link established, and if there is one, the impact is likely highly variable depending on the type of education, how it's delivered, and how it's received. We also do not have evidence of a direct relationship between terrorism and poverty or social inequality. Most terrorism researchers believe poverty and social inequality can provide an enabling environment where radicalization can be more likely to occur, such as poorer, disadvantaged populations that can serve as a pool to recruit from. But in some areas, we actually see lower levels of terrorism with high levels of inequality and poverty, while in other areas, the wealthy classes are just as likely and more likely in some some cases, to support terrorist violence. In fact, many terrorists come from privileged and wealthy backgrounds, Osama bin Laden being a prime example, or, at the very least, they certainly aren't poor and disadvantaged.
damaged. So, in short, evidence on links between socioeconomic factors and terrorism is sketchy, incomplete, and highly context-specific, with more research needed to really tease out these potential relationships. And that's where we're going to leave off for this week. Next week, we'll continue looking at radicalization by concentrating on the spread of terrorism and hate in cyberspace. Have a good one.